Okay, so if you turn to the next slide in the presentation, it's called the Public Land Survey System. And this is the cadastral system that we use for designating lands in the United States, meaning that this is the legal description. This is the way um, legally different plots of land are described in most of the United States. Um, basically, it's a grid system. It's a giant grid that covers most of the country um, like a, what? Like a chessboard or a checkerboard, right? This is why it's the public land system, the public land survey system that means that Kansas looks like a checkerboard when you fly over it in an airplane, right? Because the government has surveyed all the land or most of the land in the country in terms of this grid system and laid out both baselines and range lines and split the country up into these one square mile units, which are then subsequently subdivided into different size plots of acreage, right? Now, the system was originally proposed and developed by Thomas Jefferson, and it was implemented in the years following uh, independence after the Constitution was ratified. So it's fairly old, but because of this, it doesn't exist in the original 13 colonies because they had mostly already been surveyed using the old system of meets and bounds, which is an old, I say old, I mean, I think it's medieval system of survey, which was used in Europe and the United States and other places, you know, prior to, let's say, the Enlightenment and modern times, right? Um, so, so the public land survey system covers most of the country but not all of it. So it, it does not include the original 13 colonies and I think maybe parts of Tennessee or Kentucky or something like that, right? Um, it, uh, it's administered by the Bureau of Land Management, I believe by the General Land Office or the GLO or GLO, right? Um, the public land survey was actually conducted not all at once, but piecemeal as the United States spread across the continent. There are actually 37 different surveys, um, most of them performed in the 19th century. Um, many of these surveys, which covered very large areas, were conducted um, very quickly, rapidly, um, sometimes by people who weren't paid a lot, sometimes by people who weren't very competent, and they contain numerous errors. But rather than correcting the errors, the government has decided long ago to just retain the errors and just map stuff the way it was originally mapped. So you'll see many irregularities in the uh, public land survey system. It also incorporates land that was previously surveyed in various ways. So in places like Florida and Louisiana and Texas, it it incorporates and contains previous land grants given by the colonial governments, like Spanish land grants and French land grants, which mostly front along rivers and bayous and extend back to the uh, back swamp. So you see long, narrow um, sections, what are called irregular sections, that are part of the public land survey system but do not conform to the checkerboard pattern of the rest of the system. Okay, so um, here's a kind of grainy looking map of, the, of the, the public land survey system surveys. And you'll see that it does not include New England, the original 13 colonies, or Kentucky, or Tennessee, or Texas because of course Texas was an independent republic before it became part of the United States and it was surveyed, um, I don't know what, presumably by the Spanish but perhaps also by the Mexican national government before it became part of the United States. However, you'll note that Florida is incorporated in the public land survey system and you can see it on our maps, which I'll show you in a minute, right? Um, the basic idea 
is that you know in surveying this sort of checkerboard type pattern they uh, the surveyors established um, baselines and range lines and then demarcated or marked out six square mile townships they were um, um, excuse me not six square mile townships but six mile square townships they were square and they were six miles on the side and each contains 36 one mile sections that are divided by what are called section lines right now each township and uh, each township has a separate designation that is um, based on sort of where it's located in that public land survey. Uh, so they tend to run, you know, north, south, and east, west. So it'll be like township, you know, six east, four north, or something like that. I'm going to show you sort of how you figure that out from a map. Because you also need to know, you know, you also need to know or be able to determine the location of project areas, survey areas, and archaeological sites in the public land survey system, because that's information that's required on things like state site forms and on other types of, of documentation that we typically need to, um, to fill out. You know, in other words, it's just part of the documentation we need to create when we're doing archaeological field work, right? So, um, if you turn to the next slide, uh, which is labeled PLSS, you can see a diagram. You can see a diagram, just so you know what slide you're looking at. Um, right? So, uh, as you can see in that slide, right, the townships run north-south. There's, you know, township one north, township two north, township one south, township two south. Um, on either side of the east-west baseline of the survey, right? And then the ranges run east-west. So there's range one east, range two east, range one west, range two west, based on where you are in relation to the, the principal meridian or the main range line of a particular survey, right? Within each township, each square township, which measures six miles by six miles. There are 36 sections which are numbered in a particular order, right? Number one is in the northeast corner, and then the numbers go up as you go west. So it goes from east to west. It goes one, two, three, four, five, six, and then it, it swings around and goes seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So if this is your your township, right? I have to do it the way you would be seeing it, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and so forth and so on until you end up with 36 in the southeast corner, as you can see from the slide that you should be looking at, right? Now, within each section, a typical standard section measures one mile by one mile. Um, you know, for some purposes that's specific enough. You just say what section it's in. But for other purposes, you need to be more specific. And the way you specify a location within a section is by saying which quarter of the section it's in. Is it the northeast quarter, the northwest quarter, the southeast quarter, or the southwest quarter? And you can be even more specific. These are called aliquots. Um, you know, you can say it's in the northwest quarter of the southeast quarter, right? And so that gets you down to like an eighth of a mile square, right? As you can see in the lower right-hand picture on the slide, right? The next slide explains sort of how all of these aliquots work. You don't need to know much about that other than that you can specify a location by talking about what quarter it's in or what quarter quarter it's in, right? So the northeast quarter of the southwest quarter 
or the southwest quarter or the northeast quarter or whatever, right? That's the notation that's used for providing more specific information. Now, if you have a house, say in Florida, and you've looked at the deed or the title, you'll see that it specifies what plot of land you own using this system, right? But you can even get more specific by specifying what plat, mat, and what lot you're looking at. But we don't typically do that in archaeology, okay? Um, there's, I have provided some information in the presentation about sort of how this works in Louisiana, which is a little bit divergent. And, um, and in a minute, I'm going to talk about uh, meets and bounds. But before we do this, I want to show you on a USGS 1 to 24,000 topographic map how you identify what township, section, and range you're in. So if the camera person would come closer, right? Um, in general, on these maps, the township section and range lines are marked in red, right? The township and range are marked in the margins, typically, not always, but typically in the margins, right? So if you look right here, you can see in red that it says Township 51 South and Township 52 South, right? T51S, T52S. And that corresponds to this red line that disappears under the road and then reappears. And then it like takes an angle, which it shouldn't do. That's an error, right? And again, it's under a street. They're very often under streets, particularly in cities, right? And then it continues over here, and we can follow it out, out to the edge here, right? Where again, it says T51 South, that's Township 51 South, and then Township 52 South. So you know that everything north of here is Township 51 South, and everything south of here is Township 52 South, right? Now, what about the range? Okay, here we've got the range line, right? See, it says R41E and R42E. So everything on this side of the invisible line is range 41 east, and on, over here it's range 42 east. Now, the line runs down this road, and you can't see it, and you can't see it. Oh, and there, there it shows up. You see the red line there? And it continues up, oh, and then it disappears under a street. Oh, and here it reappears, right? So if this is Township 51 South and this is Range 41 East, then this area is part of Township 51 South, Range 41 East. Whereas this area is Township 51 South, Range 42 East, right? And this area south of the range line is going to be Township 52 East. Oh, excuse me, Township 52 South and Range 41 East. Okay? So that's the township that you're in, right? However, we need to be more specific. So let's see if we can find the section numbers, right? Section numbers also be t tend to be written in red and they're generally in this approximately in the center of the square one mile sections. So we've got a uh, somewhere here, we've got a one mile section. I'm not sure exactly where it is, but this is the this is the section number. So that's section 22, section 23, section 24, which is this area here. Section 25 is this square mile here. 25, 26, 27, 28, then goes out onto the next map sheet and it comes around and we've got section 34, section 35, section 36. In these urban areas, it can be very difficult to identify the exact section boundaries. Um, but if we let me pull out a more rural map where it's easier to see. So 
So for example, on this map, which is, oh, it's North Fort Lauderdale, you can see here's a section line, and here's a section line, and you can see that there's a square here. It's marked out by roads and other things, but that's a one mile square section. Um, this is a one mile square section here. Out in rural areas, it's much easier to see it. So this is section 18 of, well, it's Township 49 South, right? And Range 42 East, section 18, okay? Um, here's another map, right? Here it's a little bit clearer. This is a one mile square section, section 36, right? 35, 34, 33, and it comes around. This is section 25, and you can see that the, the red section number is approximately in the center of the one mile square. This is section 30 of a different township because this is actually the range line between the townships. So this is range 42 east and this is range 43 east. So here's another square section and here's another square section, one mile by one mile. Okay? So you need to be able to figure out what section you're in. Okay? Now, um, <clears throat> before they started the public land survey system, they used the old medieval European survey system, which is called meets and bounds. And if you turn to the next slide, you'll see a little slide on that, right? There's much more you can say about it. There are many, many, many books on it, right? But the basic idea is that you'd hire a surveyor who would find or start at a particular identifiable point of reference that would serve as a basic landmark in the area, right? And then they would measure the angle and the distance along the property line until they had to turn to follow the property line and they'd either establish uh, a new landmark or point of reference there like a cairn of stones or a post or something like that, right? And then they calculate the new angle and follow it as far as appropriate for the, the edge of the property boundary. And they'd eventually you know, work their way back along a polygon to the original starting point, right? So, so the way land was described, particularly for the purposes of ownership and rights was, you know, you start at the fence post in the corner of the Johnson property, right, in the southeast corner of the Johnson property, and you go 250 rods, you know, northwest at an azimuth of, you know, what, 283 degrees until you reach the tree that looks like a bear and then you follow the stream northeast at an azimuth of, you know, 18 degrees until you reach the bear that looks like a tree, and then you turn southwest for 27 rods, you know. So it, it was basically sort of a narrative description of the boundaries of a piece of land using landmarks, angles, and measurements. And that's the system of meets and bounds. Um, it was used in all over colonial America. Um, you know, the earliest land surveys in Mexico used that system, so clearly the Spanish used it, that was the Spanish system. Um, the English used a similar system in the original 13 colonies. Uh, the French used a similar system. Um, and it just eventually got to be replaced in the United States by this somewhat more systematic approach of using the public land survey system. So if you're looking in um, 
you know, if you're working in the original 13 colonies or Texas or Tennessee or Kentucky or New England, you know, you may, I mean, you'll find a different system on the map. So I'm not particularly familiar with it because I haven't worked there very much. Um, but undoubtedly, you'll learn on the job there if you have to, right? Um, there's one more uh, survey system that you should at least be, you should at least know that it exists, right? It is also marked on the USGS, United States Geological Survey, uh, 1 to 24,000 topographic quadrangle maps. Um, and it's used primarily for uh, sort of engineering and construction purposes around the country. And it's called the State Plain System. And the reason it exists is that it was developed by engineers and cartographers uh, to create a rectangular coordinate system uh, with unusually small errors or distortions. It's actually comprised of, of, um, of a whole bunch of small scale projections that are applied to different parts of the, of the different states um, to achieve very high accuracy for mapping and engineering purposes, right? Because, you know, if you're building a natural gas pipeline across the country, you know, you can't have a gap because the coordinate system didn't work, right? You can't have any gap at all, otherwise the gas comes out of the pipe, right? Same thing with sewer pipes, you know, roads need to meet in the middle, right? You know that the original Transcontinental Railroad, when they finally got to the, when they finally finished it, they, they started from the east and they started from the west and they tried to meet in the middle, and they didn't quite meet, right? Back then, that was not shocking, but, you know, that's unacceptable today. We have to be able to measure things with greater precision than that. And that's why they developed the uh, state plane coordinate system. Um, you know, in general, it's more precise. It has less error and distortion than the UTM system because each of these little projections is smaller and more precise than the larger zones that are used for the UTM system. It is marked with tick marks on your quad maps, on the quad maps we use. We don't typically use it ourselves very much, but since we often work on projects that have been designed by engineers, right? Sometimes things like the blueprints or the project descriptions that we employ or have to understand use the state plane coordinate system. So you should know that it exists. Um, it has a, it's designed to have a maximum error of one out of 10,000, right? And the, the boundaries of the different zones in the state plane coordinate system are you know, follow political boundaries, so obviously like states. So if you look at the, the map of the United States in the next slide, you'll see that um, some of the smaller states just have one state plane coordinate zone in them, right? But larger states tend to have two or three or more, right? So Florida has three. There are two zones um, in the state plane coordinate system in Florida. Uh, in Peninsular Florida, and there's one that's basically the panhandle. Um, as I say, other states like, uh, I don't know, North Carolina and Tennessee just have one zone. South Carolina has one zone. Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama have two zones. Um, you know, the state is split east-west into two separate projections for the state plane coordinate system, and so on and so forth. So if you come look at the map, just so you know it's here, right? Um, you can see here, for example, this here, this tick mark on the edge of the map, it says 570,000 feet. So that tick mark is part of the state plane coordinate system. That's all you really need to know about it. And with that, we're done talking about projections, but I will be asking you questions on the geography quiz about, you know, UTM coordinates and um, the public land survey system and things like that because those are things that you absolutely definitely need to be able to handle 
to actually carry out your job if you get hired as a field archaeologist. Thanks very much. We can talk about this more. Let me know if you have any questions.